How's everybody doing? Awesome. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, so I just want to start with the concept of modern attack. It gets thrown out a lot, like we need to modernize how we play. What does that mean to you guys? Are there any kind of key concept words? Uh, what, what, what do you guys think of when you're looking at modern attack when it comes to uh, the game now? Uh, versatility of the players. Versatility of the players? More dynamic forward play, forward incorporation more than that. All right. Like structure. structure. Anything else? What, what is the one, three, three, one. Yeah, that's that's definitely one of those structures, right? Um, yeah, a lot of people go to those buzzwords, the one, three, three, one. How we're distributing our forwards across the field. I like versatility of, of our forward pack. Uh, just before I give my short answer here, like disclaimer: there are a million ways to approach a pack, um, and I encourage you to go and see as many as possible. Uh, mine are very heavily influenced by rugby league from my time in Australia. Um, so I might be referencing a little bit of that if I say something kind of crazy that refers to that. Um, feel free to, to stop me, but I encourage you to get see as many different resources on how to attack and, and how to implement modern attacks and uh, get, as, get as many ideas as you can and steal as many as you can. Um, for me, it's all about options. Uh, on feet is, is a really big one, so um, having people... Uh, excuse me. So if we have a shape right here, if we feed the front guy in the pod, we've got multiple options either side. We build levels to the attack, right, where we can get the ball wider. Um, and then when we got versatility of players, not only versatility of players, but understanding the individual strengths of the players. So we're going to go through the process of kind of planning uh, and how we would go to implement uh, a modern attacking strategy in one of your clubs uh, for this session. And then I'm going to provide a whole bunch of supplementary resources. Uh, online afterwards that might help you kind of drill down and refine what's going to be the right approach to your club because every single uh, team that's here, you're going to want to take a slightly different approach to highlight the strengths of your players, maybe hide a few weaknesses of your players. Uh, the first concept I want to share is mini games versus big games. Um, this is how I break down and coach rugby. Um, so the mini game is being played by pretty much everyone on the field. It's we've got a set amount of space a set amount of attackers and a set amount of defenders and can we get that little win which is quick ball and go forward or can we get that big win which is going to be a line break so one of our mini game setups might be these four cones right here right we've got these four defenders in front of us and we're just trying to get over the game line with them the big game is going to be played by our core decision makers this can be different for every team um, it's really, really important to have uh, to build a, a wide cast of decision makers in your team, um, or at least people who can step into those roles wide. What happens in a lot of teams when they're trying to implement a modern attack and their number, their top playmaker goes down, right? So we want to create simple decisions that um, multiple athletes can, can pick up on and, uh, and implement in our attack. Uh, the big games then are to create mini games uh, with advantages, right? So. If you see a number three out here on the wing defending our 14, 15, and seven, we might try to play this mini game on the edge by moving the ball out here. That would be the big game. Does that make sense there, though? Um, so in terms of creating and implementing an attacking strategy, the first thing we're going to want to understand is our team's profile. Uh, we'll have someone volunteer here in a second, and we'll try to start to uh, develop mini games and successful big games for our teams. Um, there are a whole bunch of questions that you want to answer. Uh, a squat is a really good place to start on your team. What are my strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are our opportunities, things that could become strengths? You know, by the time preseason is over, what are things that could become strengths by the time, uh, you know, in two weeks from now if we're in the middle of the season, right? Uh, strengths and weaknesses of key individuals. Uh, a really important question is how many players do we need to win a rup? If we need four players to win a breakdown, just because of our breakdown skill, is a one three three one going to be a very successful structure for us? No, because we don't. Uh, hopefully, we don't need five players. That's definitely something that needs to be an opportunity for our breakdown skill. Uh, but it's important to be honest with that. How does our team create and exploit space? How are some ways that teams can create and exploit space? Any any ideas on that? Yeah, really good. So if we can create mismatches in the bigger game context, if we can 
trap the wrong players that we want to attack the wrong players for defending us in the in those areas of the field. That can be a really good uh, way that we can create an exploit space. How about simpler within our shapes? Are we going to create space if our pod is there? No. So spacing and alignment is really really important. I think discipline uh, was one of the values that that was uh, listed for this uh, uh, this session and. The reason I chose discipline is there's got to be a lot of attention to detail um, when getting your attacking structures because that spacing being five meters apart instead of three meters apart can be crucial. The way that we run a line, not just running straight to the space, but using a wide line where we create a hard step and then attack the space can be absolutely crucial. Um, so spacing and alignment, uh, the shape of running lines, uh, shifting the point of attack is another great way. Um, so that's when we're going to play off 10 more. Uh, in general, is your team better off playing off nine or attacking off ten? Uh, what what characteristics of a team would make it better for attacking off nine? Any ideas? Forwards heavy. All right, forwards heavy. So we want to get the ball in their hands as quickly as possible so they can get moving forward. I like that. What else? Weather conditions. Weather conditions. That's a really good one. We're getting ready to play in a in a maelstrom. We probably don't want to be having too many passes. Anything else? Uh, obviously, skill for 9 and 10. Uh, playing off 10, we need to have a 9 that's got absolutely great speed of delivery of the ball to the 10, uh, especially as we get to higher levels of the game. Um, I'm going to show you a kind of time stamped uh, uh, clip at the end of uh, a blitz defense from Lindenwood. Um, they can get to a 10, uh, our, our first receiver, if they're about 10 meters wide, 8 meters back, about 1.7 seconds, right? So, and from that, uh, from the play of the ball. So, if that's the case, if we want to play off 10, we have to have an absolutely excellent play from nine. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit weird, but there's less pressure on your nine if you're attacking off of nine. Any other ideas? Uh, are there any other questions that you think you, uh, are important to, to understanding what your team profile is? Um, so does anyone want to have a team that's going to be our guinea pig here? Okay. What club are you with? Um, Mine's Mount Chaos. Okay. Um, so let's quickly go through these questions. What's your team's strengths? Uh, size. Size? All right. Weaknesses? <coughs> Athleticism. So we're good. Speed mismatches might be a, a tough thing to create. Um, are there any individuals we should know strengths and weaknesses for? Uh, nine, nine. Strong? Strong decision makers? Yes. Okay. Any other key strengths of those you're not in town? They're the two that normally aim the best on other Okay. Um, how many people do you need to win a run? Uh, two? Okay. That's really good. Um, how does your team create and exploit space? It sounds like getting a quick ball game to go forward uh, through the boards. Yeah, through the boards and pods, one pod, pods. Okay. Um, and then we want to attack off nine or ten. So you go a good play making ten. Okay. Usually nine. Okay. Off of nine. Good stuff. We're going to come back to that. Remember all those answers. There's one a step one B uh, that's absolutely crucially important, um, and that's training continuity and attack because uh, we have really beautiful structure. And what a lot of teams will do is they'll get the ball and they'll send it all the way out to this fourteen, and this fourteen has made this wonderful line break. Uh, and that's what the picture looks like, where no one has supported the ball there. Um, and this isn't going to pay off for us winning the big game for getting points on the board. It's probably going to result in a turnover and us being under pressure now. So building continuity and attack is uh, a crucially important step one. I'm just going to run through a quick principle of uh, how we can address continuity and attack. Um, so there's two concepts, support the space, support the ball. Uh, supporting the space if you're finding your own lateral space in the field. Uh, we're seeing that right now with all of these pictures and attack. Everyone's found their own lateral space on the field. They're supporting the space. Um, when you support the space, start of the phase and structured play. Um, if you're uh, close support to the ball here, but we're before contact, we're away from contact, uh, and then just generally supporters away from the ball. We don't want these guys all collapsing down to the touch line to support the ball here. We want them to stay in the space, right? The other concept is supporting the ball. We're falling directly behind the ball carrier. Uh, when we do this pretty much every phase for nine, uh, we always want nines to be on the inside shoulder and support, especially the line breaks. 
Uh, after passing is always a good option. That's something you've probably seen in sevens a lot. Uh, the one is three closest players. Sometimes a flood shape, sometimes not. Uh, or if the ball carrier just runs into your space, we want it to click in our athlete's head that that's a time to uh, support the ball if the ball carrier is needing the space. It's just some quick pictures of what that looks like. Here we see the Brumbies supporting the space. Uh, each guy is lining up in his own lateral channel. That's forcing the Reds' defense to spread out. Ultimately, this guy is going to get into the space out of the picture because these guys are creating options uh, in the lateral space. Here, we have the ball going to a breakdown, and we see these three attackers starting to collapse in on it uh, to support. You've got the guy on the right side running into space uh, when he's supporting the ball to be an offload option. You've got the other two guys coming in there to support the breakdown if he gets tackled. Notice, again, we have these players on either side of that tight little picture supporting the space to force the defense to spread out, right? Um, another one, here we've got Carlin Isles reacting to his teammate ball carrier running across into his space, so he's gonna change from supporting the space to supporting the ball. Uh, one last one, we've got a line break from the Fijians, so the number nine slots in behind uh, number two to react to the picture that's changing in terms of the line that he's running. That's where we're supporting the ball. Uh, just a game that's really, really simple uh, that can uh, uh, get you trained support space versus support the ball is you have uh, just five attackers versus five defenders. One pass, the attacker takes it up. Once he gets touched, plays it to the next person, and then you give a double whistle. On a double whistle, all that first row of defenders has to do an up-down. Then these players break out and attack, and it forces the two closest attackers to decide to support the ball the ones who aren't closest to support the space, and then they have to be a second level of defense. Does everyone understand those concepts uh, and, and how this game would progress and, and reinforce the support of the space for the ball? Um, one other thing we're gonna get through as we train the mini games, once we get into structure, we don't wanna lose these concepts. So as a typical training rule, I always say three passes after any line break, right? So we're always having the mindset that we need to support the ball once we go through again. Uh, the, step, the second step is to find a mini game plan, right? How do we win a quick ball, go forward and quick ball in this little bit of space here? Uh, how do we uh, create line breaks if we, if we have the appropriate space? So we're talking here, we've got a team with really, really strong forward play. Um, we've got a good nine, a good 10 decision-making core. Uh, is there much of a decision-making core beyond nine and 10 throughout the rest of your back line? No, not the back line. The rest of the okay. Okay, sweet. So there are tons of different structures and everyone loves the one, three, three, one, two, four, two, just because you can see good images of it, of it on TV. Uh, at the University of Illinois this year, we ran a two, 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 two. Uh, you can have different numbers of core players, you can bring wings in, you can count centers sometimes. Uh, the way modern centers go is part of this distribution of players across the field. It really comes down to who are your players that are better suited to, to not be in those decision-making roles are oftentimes going to be the players that you're going to want to spread across the field. Um, again, if you, need, if you need three players or four players to win a rock, you're gonna have to adjust your, your structure accordingly. Um, so with that, we can win a ruck with two players here. So we'll just stick with the one, three, three, one. Um, we've already got it set up. So it's very, very simple, right? Um, the next thing we're gonna start to think about is what is our shape, right? So we've got a really, really physical pack here. Um, obviously, we wanna create space for a, a forward runner to, we don't wanna have two on one packs, right? So. We can either create spacing by spreading that pot out. Um, the one thing to realize is if you don't have head pass skill, if you want to change the point, shift the point of attack, if you wanted to throw a tip pass, if your team if your team can't reliably throw a five meter pass, then maybe we need to shorten that spacing up to three meters. Another thing often we could do is we could always try to double up on our size. We can still have one player latching. Um, this is a shape with really big forward packs that I like to play a lot, sorry, get the 12 out of there, where we have uh, an inside player latching onto our point runner here, we have a tip option out the side, and then we wanna sit our key decision makers out the back so they can play the big game, right? Um, do you have a shape that you run in your team? 
On the inside. Okay. So we'll create a little bit of separation here and still get to that space. Like that, a lot of the defense starts to set up something like this. The next thing we need to establish for our team and train is a menu of options, right? So, what options could, if we're going to just say keep it simple, we're always going to play from our nine straight to this first player, what are the options that we have? So yeah, we can we can throw a tip pass, right or left. We've got the ten who can roll out the back. Are there any other options? Yeah, we can always carry. Any other options that we see? Yes. Yeah, we could we could always uh, let our forwards kick. Uh, another decision that we could uh, level that we can add to it is the depth decision. If we want to be in a situation where we're going to play the ball behind the line. We probably want that forward just catching the ball with the shuffle step so they haven't taken away all their space, right? Um, but let's say we've got a really spread out defense here. Call back to no. Um, we might elect, and we've got a defense on the back foot. We might elect for each of these forwards to select a gap to run out. And then we can play flat to the line with our nine. Right, so we've built uh, probably three or four options here. We've got carry, we've, uh, if we're playing deep, we've got the carry option, we've got tip left or right, we've got the out the back option, and we also now have the option to play flat. So now we need to train our players to first understand the key details, the attention to detail on those options. Uh, and I'm gonna quickly get up my cones here, and if I can get eight people on their feet, We're going to look at how we can potentially train this. So if I can get four on this side, four on that side. Excuse me, I forgot my back defenders here. Excuse me, sword. Thank you. All right, so you don't. Good. So I'm going to be I'm going to be playing nine for you here. We've got a breakdown. We want to show a couple of different pictures. So the first thing that we want to show uh, is the picture where we probably want to right. So if you guys can just set up that shape, kind of compressed, you've got the guy on the inside, someone out the back, someone out of the tip option on the side. There we go. Let's get a little bit wider with that outside tip option. Like it. So the first thing that we want to show the, them as we're doing our walkthroughs is just mirroring them. And if you guys can put a cone down, one person defending me, uh, the other three of you guys just mirroring what you see in front of you. You have one on me, the other three just mirroring directly in front of someone. And what all we're going to do is we're going to do walkthroughs in the options uh, of each of these options given the space setup that we've done. So the first one we want to carry. Uh, I always try to teach teams to carry to the outside shoulder. The reason is the average rugby professional rugby takes five seconds if you attack the inside shoulder, on average 2.8 seconds if you attack the outside shoulder. Um, so all we're going to do is a walkthrough, play the ball to our first receiver. He's going to go outside shoulder. He's seeing that picture straight into contact. We've got our two guys are going to react to support the ball. There we go. Good job. First option done. Thank you. And I'll take the ball back and we'll reset. Next one, uh, show me a very narrow defense here. And yep, just a very narrow defense, come in nice and tight. Just put a cone down at your feet wherever you end up. So now what are the op what options do we have that are gonna exploit this space? So we've got the tip option, or what other one could we hit? We could hit the out the back. So let's just hit a tip option first. We're gonna walk through, draw the defender, hit the space, Good job. Second one, we need to focus on the details. So where does this attacker need to be in order to create space for this guy? He needs to be taking that flat pass, so it, and he's got to come in nice and tight. Ideally, uh, you want to be able to slap the bum of the guy you're receiving a tip pass from, right? So let's just see that option rolling out the back. Beauty. 
And then now spread evenly from uh, me to Tyler. And that would be, oh, we had another set of cups. Just go uh, these upside down to mark where you're at. Yeah, spread out evenly all the way to the spice. All the way up, keep going, keep going, spread, spread, spread. Go to really spread out the fence. So now this is the option where we want to hit that flat line, right? So we see that everyone wants to run at a different gap. So which gap are you going to run at? Just point at it. Perfect. So we're going to go. I'm nine. I draw a defender. We run at a gap. We hit a flat pass. Try to put them into spice. Really good. So that's the walkthrough portion of it. The next thing we're going to do is train it at, at speed. So if I can get you guys as defenders to come in nice and tight, we'll do all of this at a brisk walk. I'll call black, orange, or upside down. Does that make sense for which one you go to? Yeah. All right. And you guys see what's in front of you. Attack what you see. Uh, if you want flat, call flat, and I'll throw it to you when you run onto it. Uh, otherwise, call tip, roll, for out the back, or just carry. Okay? See what? Uh, let's go upside down. What do you want? What do you want? Flat, 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 flat. Good. Through a hole. So are we going to pass before contact if we're taking a flat pass? Cool. We'll do two more of these. Two more of these. Let's see how we go. All right. Uh, black. <laughs> Boom. Good. Obviously, we're doing this at a full sprint with our teams because we're not doing it in a tiny conference room. Uh, let's go orange. All right. Cool. Um, so one thing, we've got these guys going through a hole. What would be the rule if we had more space behind them after they got through a gap? Three passes. So over, when we're doing an overspeed training, we always want to be going through the hole even if we're getting touched. Um, I said typically we'll give one point to the team if they get touched and go through a hole, three if they get a clean break, and then we give them an additional point if they get those passes. Thank you guys for uh, all being part of that. So we're going to try uh, to train. Push. Skips a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, so I skipped ahead on my slideshow. Uh, we want to do walking pace for comprehension. We might do this in a classroom setting. We want to do it over speed, and that was a great activity that we could do over speed. Um, the next thing that we want to do is overly physical. We can use that exact same game uh, and just make it a full contact version of that. Uh, and we want to get the team used to the pressures of both speed and physicality through our training environment, right? Um, I like doing these as full part full sessions, and uh, I'll bring come back to this game. I've got like three or four other ones that are slightly different augmentations of the same thing um, that we're going to do throughout the season uh, that keeps it familiar, changes it up a little bit, um, but makes it something that's super easy to get into in our training environment. Uh, some complementary parts that we can do is clearance passing for our nine. Uh, we can do a part section on reach that pass, offload, uh, Y lines and change of direction, carry and contact breakdown, draw and pass depth decision. Um, are there any other skills that you think you might want to train as part segments to this whole session? All right, well, so we're going to get to the big games here in a second, and I 100% agree with you. Um, that's going to be our next step in this uh, progression that we're looking at. Uh, no, 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 you're good. You're good, Mike. That's a good observation that we do need to build to that. Um, the other thing to emphasize is we can work on our attack on our defensive days, right? If we're doing a physical stress day, uh, we can be doing our part segments focused on tracking, tackling, etc., and we can be working in our, our shapes and our structures, right? Uh, the next thing, uh, right after what you said, is we're going to train to win big games. Um, and we want to make the decision about whether to go wide and where we attack to be something really, really simple. Because remember, we want to have as many decision makers uh, in our side as possible. Um, so this is something that's taken from Rugby League. Uh, it's called Reading the Four in Defender. And you can bring a video here. Uh, so it's a very simple concept, counting from the outside in. We're, we're picking the fourth defender and we're reading where they are. If that defender is uh, between the posts, we call that at 50. If uh, we're looking kind of uh, the forward defender from this touchline is out here, if they're about 60, we're saying what percent of the field they have covered with their fourth, uh, up to their fourth defender. With the decision about whether to go wide, we're looking for the forward defender 
to be inside 50, that means we go wide. If we see the foreign defender is outside 50, we want to play it tight. Problem. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so first, I'm going to just play the clip through. We attack on the inside. Um, I think this is a really interesting clip because the Wallabies start attacking out to the left. That four in defender is outside 50. They're beyond the post. So all they can really do here is play short. The assumption is that these four defenders, if these guys out the back had gone wide, would have been able to cover that space, right? So we come back the other direction. We freeze. We see the foreign defender is outside of 50, outside of the post. So the decision is that there's space on the inside, right? And clearly, that's reflected by the space that currently deal exploits right here. There's the picture. There's part of it. And now we've created a simple read. Here again, um, we have France attacking the All Blacks. We've got Manano as the foreign defender. He's inside 50, so that means we want to attack wide. Now, the first shape that we can attack to is the shape here off of 10. And the decision isn't necessarily that we have to go all the way to the touchline. It's just that it's advantageous for us to attack outside of this first shape. Does that make sense? So we play it through. Big gap opens up because the foreign defender is inside 50. Here's another interesting one. Uh, we're right on our own defensive try line, uh, attacking out. We recognize the foreign defender is at about 40. He's inside 50, so the space is wide. And that's another way that we can attack out to the spice. Um, I also like this clip uh, just because it shows, you know, there was a small line break. We got a little win uh, in terms of our big game. But unless we have that continuity and attack and that mindset to support the ball after the line break, uh, we're not going to finish off our opportunities. And uh, the attacking team there did a really great job. Uh, here we have the cause attacking the Highlanders. Again, forward defender inside 50 means there's a lot of space wide. We want to get the ball out. And we're ultimately able to score. So that's kind of to prove the concept. Um, the question I want to ask, uh, why do we think that the foreign defender is a good one to read? Any ideas on why they do that in lead? So first of all, in our one three one uh, one three three one shape, how many players can we potentially have able to attack on on the wing uh, out to that side? Usually five to six, right? We probably have our ten tied up with a pod. If we're going all the way across the field, we probably have another playmaker tied up in a pod. Um, our one wing might be trapped over here. So we have probably at least four players out there on the edge, right? Um, the concept is that if we have a four on four with 35 meters of space, we should be able to create a, a manufacturer of line break. Um, obviously, if we can turn defenders hips, we can create hip space, even if we've got even, uh, uh, an even matchup. Um, there's also speed mismatches. Uh, and if I could get someone on feet, if uh, anyone doesn't mind volunteering. Anyone? So we've probably got someone faster than me if you just don't mind standing in front of me, um, right here in front of us. But we can still have a speed mismatch, even if we're not the fastest person, if we don't have enough space, using really good line running. Uh, I call it Y line. So if I can get this guy to uh, commit his hips this way, I just need to be faster than him to this space right here. That's the race. I've created basically a cheat code for myself, right? by getting his hips turned sideways. If we have a wide open field and he doesn't have any defenders that can come in and support him there, I'm probably getting an arm tackle. And if I'm giving up speed on him, I might have size and strength. And I might be able to get through him even if he gets that arm tackle on me. So that's where the concept is important. Thank you very much. 
Uh, that's where the concept of four in comes in. If we have 35 meters of space in four on four, or five on four, or six on four, we should be able to manufacture something even if it's just a line break or a good go forward from that situation. So uh, training to win the big gangs is uh, the next step in our, our process. Um, obviously going to be a little bit de difficult to demonstrate here in this tight space. Uh, but could I get my first pod here real quick? And could I get uh, a second group of players out the back that they can play to? Maybe those people in the corner, if you guys don't mind standing up. So I'm just going to suggest a couple of ideas about how we can train it. So the first thing um, we will probably look at is some sort of walkthrough to build patterns. Um, patterns are just our methods of moving the ball throughout our structure, right? So if we're playing off nine, our pattern to, and we go straight to this guy, what might our pattern be? So we're going to throw a tip pass and then we're going to go out to them. That could be one way we get it there. Can I get the ball back? What's another way that we could just walking through get the ball to that pod? Good. And going that way. If I if I have if we call for a flat one, so if I have you guys running to the line, I can go there, right out the back. So we with our pattern, we want to build out a menu of ideas for our players of how to do it when they have no stressors and no pressure whatsoever. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add pressure. Can I get four of you guys <coughs> on feet here? And uh, do I, would you mind slinging this over your shoulder? I'm sorry, it smells bad. <laughs> Should have said anything. <laughs> um, so we're going to have these guys start in the middle of the field here, nice and tight together. Uh, he's our foreign defender, right? So we're reading him. So uh, I want the decision coming from you out the back of the second pod. Uh, you're going to be reading the foreign defender you call on. If you see that he's inside 50, you don't have to say anything. If he's outside 50, judge where roughly the middle of the space is. Um, so these guys are starting on their stomachs, and I'll either call right, left, or spread, and they're going to have to go touch the left touch line and accordion back out, touch the right touch line and accordion back out, or they can just spread across the field uh, however is comfortable for them. Um, if you don't hear an on call, then you're just letting them play in the, sh the shape here. If you hear on, we're using our pattern to go that way, right? So if I say left, we're going to all touch that accordion and start accordioning back, and we're going to play through all balls coming from nine. As they accordion back out, accordion back out. Yeah, you, you need to stay on the inside, stay on the inside. Oh, they accordion back out really fast. Nothing's called. According, uh, if they're coming from the left, they're probably he's probably going to be outside 50. So that's a good call right there. So if we just say spread, go ahead and spread. Playing. What do we see? <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. So he's in. We say he's probably inside 50 here. So we're going to call on, and that's just going to uh, trigger that we want to play it out the back. Okay. Right? So let's just get that on call. On. Yeah. Good. And then we're attacking out in that space. Obviously, in a dynamic environment, we can attack with speed or with pace, uh, or uh, we can stress with speed or we can stress with physicality right there. If we were to say right, so everyone's got to accordion to the right touch line, start accordioning out. What are we calling? On. On. Good. Good stuff. So that's just a one simple way of doing it. We can do it with contact. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. You can have a seat. We can do it with contact, we can do it stressing with speed if we're doing non-contact. What's the rule if we make a line break? Three passes, right? Uh, now we're adding the additional decision. So if the line break was made in this first pot shape, does that second group of three, do we want them supporting the ball? Or do we want them staying in their space and just kind of coming forward? We want them staying in the space and coming forward probably, right? And let the four or so closest players, one to three closest players, worry about supporting the ball so we have options either for the next phase or we might swing it wide uh, in the context of the line break there. Um, any other uh, any other questions on that? Does that all make sense? Yeah? You talk about uh, uh, depth of passing if you're going out mm -hmm. uh, and like do you change that on the fly or do you always just kind of keep your depth of passing at the same? Um, so for me, I make uh, the depth decision in part a uh, uh, part uh, segment of my whole part whole um, when we're working on things like 3v2. And it's really simple. I just want to train if I've got someone marking me, 
um, then I want to catch the ball uh, deep and early. And if I don't have, if I'm running at space, even if it's space between two defenders, I want to be catching it late and flat. So that's a piece of it. Um, I'm gonna uh, hit hit this again with the the big games in a second here. It's a really good question. I'm gonna come to it in half a second when we get to game planning. Uh, and then we're going to do, after we've done this uh, in our kind of preseason, we're going to start to get the match simulation. You can do full contact, you can do kind of uh, wrap with rough uh, if you're not doing a physicality day that can speed up the game. So in terms of implementing this in your preseason, if you're doing 60 minute sessions, you can probably have, uh, accomplish this in eight sessions. Um, with it, uh, we don't want to do speed days and physical days uh, to get for a session things on the same day, right? So we prefer to do walkthrough and speed on the same day. We prefer to do physicality on its own day, and that might be a day that we're incorporating defensive skill uh, as well. If we're doing more of a 90 minute session, 90 minutes to two hours, I know a lot of people train like that. This is something that we can do uh, in four sessions. Again, grouping the speed elements with the walkthrough elements, uh, and then having the physicality days kind of stand alone. Um, this is just a kind of a suggestion of how you might use those, those different components that we, we put out there. Uh, so with this, you can see if you're doing like 90 to 90 minute sessions a week, if you just do one of your 90 minute sessions committed to attack, you should be able to start to implement this in about four weeks time. Uh, it's, it's quite a goal to get to. Uh, when we get to in season, um, it changes up a little bit. So uh, this is just kind of working, uh, pairing down my U of I uh, training schedule to, we were just doing it kind of at the grassroots, like what you guys actually get with your athletes. Um, Sunday, assuming a match day on Saturday, and we obviously have our athletes to active recovery. Um, and then our coaches and captains are doing a whole lot of film uh, on Sunday. We obviously want to review our last match, uh, and we want to delegate this as coaches. We don't want to do the whole uh, thing for ourselves. So have an uh, athlete who's focused on, you know, attacking breakdown. What are our key components, things that we want to focus on? Um, and similar with elements of the opposition game. We want to have one of our players focus on the attack of the opposition, one focus on the defense. Uh, so delegate and make your captains uh, help you with that. Uh, on Monday, we do a team meeting. Um, we're going to preview, uh, sorry, we're going to review our, our preview, our, Previous match. We're going to review our previous matches. I can't read my own shorthand. Um, and then we're going to look at our next opponent. And we're going to look at ways to augment how we want to play the mini games and how we want to play the big games based on what that opponent looks like. Um, Tuesday is our speed session at Illinois. Thursday is our physical uh, match or physical pressure uh, and match simulation day. And then we usually get cap in front uh, for a bit of match simulation. Um, so obviously the film component is really, really big, um, and we're looking for little details in how other teams defend that we might make small tweaks uh, to how we play the mini games and how we play the big games. So uh, first off, uh, we're looking at Michigan in defense. They're the blue team. Uh, this is a typical picture of how they defended in 2019. Uh, can anyone see an exploitable thing that happens in their defense? Uh, yeah, they're forced close to 50 on both sides. They're playing very narrow, so there's probably opportunities wide. That's a good observation. Uh, what about in the shape of the defensive line? Where are they keyed in? On the ball, right? They're on that first receiver. Uh, Michigan likes to commit two defenders. I know it's kind of a difficult picture to maybe see this. Uh, they like to have two defenders blitz out of the line on our first receiver. So it creates space. Uh, behind those listing guys. So if we have a really simple system like we set up where I've got a tip line, uh, can I get you on your feet real quick? So if you're up here and you've got two guys on you um, and then we've got a bit of a stagger there, I might just alter my tip line instead of running straight forward looking for space. I know against them that I want to train in the mini game to run this line back underneath that first defender, right? So that's one way we might start to tweak our mini games and uh, uh, for how we're going to play on the weekend. Um, the way we might train this is we have our uh, even setting for our uh, for 
for our defense in that mini game drill that we were doing earlier. But instead of making them go to a cone, uh, if I call yes, then everyone except for the two defenders on our first receiver have to do an up down before they come up. So it puts them behind the uh, behind those two blitzing defenders. That makes sense. So we just want to augment the conditions of the game to produce that picture that we're seeing on film. Um, here we've got a picture of the U.S. women versus Canada uh, from earlier this year. Uh, does anyone see where the Canadians are really key to attack this receiver? The first receiver has the ball right now. Yeah, Canadians attack the second pass. Um, so we see a lot of the same things kind of happening. We see space opening up behind that, that part attack on the second, uh, the second pass. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting for this picture is we've got the speed of pass from 9 to 10. The 10 has the ball. Does the 10 have space? Yeah, so we have really good speed of pass from our 9 to 10, um, which you would expect at, uh, at test level. Um, so that might give us some, some opportunities as well. Uh, in this situation, we have the 10 throws an early ball. It kind of gets blown up. What might this 10 do instead of throwing the early pass? Hold it, take it to the line, and let these two defender or these two attackers support players off of her. Run at uh, run at separate gaps, and then we probably have an option out the back if they're playing really narrow defense, which uh, we can't see where the foreign defender is, but they do look pretty narrow there, right? Um, so again, ways we could augment the mini games. Uh, we had the idea that we can have everyone except the person defending the second uh, pass. And uh, can do an up down. Any other ideas about how we can uh, create this picture in our mini games? So, uh, if we wanted to, if we want to really overemphasize the picture that we have time to take the ball to the line, what could we do to the offside line for the defense? Yeah, back it up. Really, really simple. Start to use kind of like a rugby league approach, where you say you have the defense has to be back five meters. And we can slowly inch it forward once that our end starts to take it in their head that they want to take the ball to the line and play flat in their shape, right? And we want to have flat options. Does that make sense? Yep, yeah, yeah, question. Okay, we're good. Um, last one I want to look at is something that's a big game. Uh, these are just uh, freeze frames from a clip by us playing Lindenwood. Uh, this one we have too many people in the ruck. Uh, at zero seconds. Uh, this is 1.6 seconds, uh, and we've pretty much got, uh, a, that's our first receiver there. He's got defenders pressuring him pretty hard. Uh, so we see a good flat blitz defense from Lindenwood in this picture. We get to 2.7 uh, seconds here, uh, and the ball's in the hands of our second receiver. We can see that they've already made it to a point of contact. They made up about 10 meters in 2.7 seconds. Um, what Lindenwood plays a banana blitz, which means they're bringing out their outside defenders. So what might we look like for in our mini games uh, about the running game lines we want to play? Where do we? Where is the space if their if their outside guys are shooting up hard? Uh, so if their outside guy is shooting up, yeah, in that gap. Yeah. So yeah, and over, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so really good. So there's space there that we can work in our mini games, and again, we can augment that delaying the, uh, the blitz of those first few receivers, or you know, maybe we'll just say, if you're outside the, fir uh, if you're outside the first four defenders, you can uh, be five meters off sides or something like that. Uh, we can augment the game that way. Um, but then in the context of the big game, right, we want to get the ball wide against Lindenwood. They have a narrow defense. Their foreign defender is nice and tight, but we're under pressure when we get to that pass, right? Um, so some ways that we can look at it is first with our walkthrough, um, we can put out defenders in front of us when we're doing that walkthrough, but instead of having the defenders in a flat line, we can just put them up and form that banana shape um, when we're doing our, our walkthrough process, and it forces them to start thinking about creating that, uh, uh, excuse me, it forces them to start thinking about when we're creating our patterns that we want to use for the week, uh, what our depth needs to be. Um, yep. Oh, sorry. Maybe you're going to get to this, but did your second receiver, was he able to offload here, uh, or was it a ruck situation? If it was a ruck situation, did you win it, given that I see 
four black shirts in the frame. Uh, he scored a try. He got through that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so he it was an arm tackle. Okay. He he ran an overs line to the space behind the uh, the to cut to that behind that uh, player with the red shorts. That's why the guy in the red shorts is recovering, right? Because the space behind him is going to attack the guy who's defending the twelve had to make an arm tackle, uh, and then uh, our fifteen there ended up in close support. If you went to ground, there was probably an offload opportunity there. But another good point: there were too many people in that rock, and there should have been people. Uh, well, I'm just wondering: is anybody in your in your one through three one there? Is there somebody behind the fifteen there? Because fifteen is going to be able to support or get the offload. But you, uh, presumably, there's another person coming in behind him, right? Yeah, yeah. There's players out wide of the frame here as well um, that, that are in support. Uh, but so getting back to the point of the big game, uh, part of it as well. Um, when we're getting to, we want to uh, stress speed, right? Uh, or stress with physicality, but we want to show this banana blitz. What are some ways that we can augment that big game if we're doing, we're collapsing to the left sideline, or we're doing the spread, or we're collapsing to the right sideline? How can we create that picture for uh, from a rule for the game that we're playing? Any ideas? Change the offside line again? Change the offside line is always a good one, um, especially if we want to see this banana blitz. Um, I would say everyone outside the foreign defender can be 10 meters offsides, and we're starting applying pressure on that, and we're forcing him to think about the depth. Any other ideas on how we could do it? If we wanted to slow things down for them, maybe instead of having that, again, we can have an up down. Everyone inside the foreign defender has to do an up down, and that's going to slow them down and create the impression of that banana defense. I think obviously in this situation when we're getting ready for a team like this, we want to be applying a bit more pressure and for them to experience that so they can create good depth. Um, any, any other question or any other thoughts on how we might uh, augment a big game, a full field game uh, like we worked on to, to get uh, team players thinking about what's a good pattern of good depth? Okay, um, last thing I just want to quickly mention, uh, set KPIs for your games. Um, there's, and be creative, uh, so the logs versus big performances is something from Eddie Jones. Uh, with Warcause, he told the team that when they average uh, players on the ground for uh, more than two seconds after a tackle, or after winning a rock, or after the breakdown is gone, uh, they won, or if it was under two seconds, he told them they, they won like 80% of the time. They only went 20% of the time to completely pay up the stat. Um, but you got players back on their feet, right? So big stands for back in game performances. Log stands for laying on the ground. Um, phases per game can be a good one. Phases per possession. Um, if we're playing too tight, if we want to incentivize wider play, um, and we're not looking for that foreign defender, we're not noticing that foreign defender, we might make passes per phase uh, a KPI for the week. Because then it's got them thinking, OK, I need to be looking for the opportunities when that foreign defender is in too tight, so we can get those passes in. Does that make sense? Um, so be really creative with your KPIs. Uh, if you have questions on them afterwards, I'm a little uh, running into the end of my time, so I'm gonna sprint through the last slide or two here. Uh, but uh, get creative, think about what you want to incentivize, uh, and, and come up with good KPIs. Uh, then lastly, uh, some additional trends and resources. Um, most innovation in Rugby Union Attack uh, were first beta tested in Rugby League. Um, I love Rugby Union more than Rugby League. I think it's a better game, it's more fun. At the same time, I watch a lot of Rugby League. Um, I'm not saying that you have to be as crazy as me. Uh, but definitely, if you're a coach consuming content, uh, definitely consume, sorry, let's wrap it up. You know. uh, definitely consume uh, a little bit of Rugby League. Uh, and just a fun fact, the tip and roll move, uh, attacking the inside shoulder of the two defender created at least one try in 90% of NRL games last year. Uh, so look for that in the probably six nations of rugby championship this year. Uh, Squid Rugby is an awesome resource to train your eyes to start seeing space. Uh, he does a really good job in how he presents it. It's a great resource to share with your younger athletes because I think a lot of them are going to connect with how he presents. Uh, it's not necessarily that you're trying to replicate the Springbok system, 
but you might see the same picture of space in your game that Springbox saw that they want to exploit. Um, it, it's really good at training your eye to see that kind of space. Um, I'm going to publish some supplementary stuff. I know I ran through a ton of uh, content in this session. Um, that will be on the Silverbacks website. If you want to give me your email, I'll send it out with a PDF uh, after uh, today. Uh, and then also, uh, our organization, Silverbacks, uh, we do long-term development for athletes. We also do it for coaches. We're going to be offering free, remote, virtual uh, learning on a continuing basis, ongoing basis. And uh, that's going to be starting soon, so we hope you'll uh, participate in that if you want to learn more uh, with a little bit more time. <laughs> uh, any questions before I wrap? Uh, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I hope uh, it was a useful talk. <laughs>